If you have your Bibles, and, and again, this is kind of a topical sermon. I, you know, through Acts, and most of the time, uh, I just kind of uh, walk down through one passage. But we're going to be looking at three different passages here today. Uh, we're going to start out in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And the title of my sermon is The Christ in Christmas. Let me give you the outline. Number one, the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of of Christ. Incarnation simply means God in human flesh. God in human flesh. Number two, the ingenious birth of Christ. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, God thought this through. God had a plan. Never in history, past history up to Jesus, had this plan uh, ever happened. Okay, and we are talking about the perfect Son of God. There is nobody perfect except Jesus. And that's the only way it would work. From fallen mankind, where Adam and Eve sin, we live in a fallen world. And Jesus, God, had a plan. And it was an ingenious birth of Christ. And number three, the infallible purpose of Christ. Why did He come? Why did he come? And can I tell you this just right off the bat? Jesus came to die. He came to die. He started in a wooden cradle, a manger most likely. And I'm telling you, he ended up on a cross. And I am so glad he did. So let's look at the Christ in Christmas. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning... And when you think of in the beginning, the first thing that flashes in my mind is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created in the heavens and the earth. And we know God is eternal. God always has been. You have to exist to create something. So there is a parallel here, and it's not talking about God, it's talking about Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. So if God always was, Jesus always is. He always was and He always is. He is, uh, you know, when you see the word, word there, it means logos in Greek. And it means God's revelation of Himself. God's revelation. If you look at the Gospels, all the Gospels start with genealogy. And, and just shows the genealogy through there, but not with John. John skips that, and his whole purpose was to show the deity of Jesus Christ. He is God. Jesus is God in human flesh. It's what he is telling them. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we know the glory of God. We will talk about that in verse 14. The glory was in the tabernacle, in the tabernacle of God, that place of worship. So we see here, in the beginning was the Word. And it is talking about Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God. We believe in the Trinity. God the Father, who created everything. Uh, God the Son, Jesus Christ, who died for you and I. And God the Holy Spirit. And if you look back in Genesis, all three of them were in creation. But Jesus was even before creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. All encompasses everything, folks. He was before creation. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. In the book of John, you will see life 36 times. Folks, Jesus is life. He is life. He is everything. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Folks, I am telling you, we live in a dark world. We live in a lost world. We live in a world where people don't care about God, where people don't recognize God, and people don't, uh, you know, uh, listen to God. God wants to be in everyone's life, and they are in darkness. In verse 5, and it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I do not think it was any mistake 
that the wise men was looking for a star, not just a star. We are talking about the star of David. We are talking about the star, the, the largest, the brightest light that shined on Jesus' birth. Now look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh. We spoke of the incarnation and dwelt among us. How did the world become flesh? Folks, it is the virgin birth. The virgin birth. And we're going to cover that in the second point. And the Word became flesh. Jesus became a person. He was 100% God. He was 100% man and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. When you saw Jesus, okay, even on the Mount of Transfiguration, He was glowing. When you saw Him walking on earth, He was doing miracles. He was a reflection of God's glory. The glory as the only begotten. And when we think of God's glory, we think of Jesus' words and Jesus' work. When we think of only begotten, we're talking about just one of a kind. There is nobody, nobody ever. Only begotten is capitalized, which shows deity. Nobody ever can even come close to who Jesus is. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace has not given us what we deserve. Mercy is not, uh, you know, you know, given us, you know, we just look at it. You think of grace and mercy, folks. We do not deserve salvation. We deserve condemnation. But God's mercy and grace came in the person of Jesus Christ. And we know what truth is. Jesus Himself said, Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth is the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Me. Oh folks, the incarnation of Christ is real. The Old Testament even speaks of this. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Go with me just quickly to this one verse. Isaiah. Isaiah 7. Verse 14. You have to realize, folks, uh, Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus' birth. This is a prophetic scripture. Something that Isaiah said was going to happen. And he got that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Notice capital S and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with us. God with us. Now let's look at Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians. Some of the most awesome scripture you'll ever read about Jesus. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. By the way, I know some of this will be a little different on your paper. It's not Chuck's fault, okay? It's my fault. I don't know, sometimes my head, you know, I'm, I'm thinking two different things and I'm writing one thing and doing another. So uh, I just want you to know what Chuck printed was what I gave him. And we had to correct it, the human side of us, okay? Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? He is the image. A reflection. When you look in a mirror, what do you see? You see a reflection of yourself. When Jesus looks in the mirror, I'm telling you, you can put God or Jesus, either one, in there. He is the image of the invisible God. See, we've never seen God. But there were folks that seen Jesus. He walked for 33 years. He had a three and a half year ministry. The apostles and the disciples went around him and they could touch him. They could pray with him. They could be with him. He was in a room and they would know when he was in a room. So we see he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn 
over all creation. Firstborn doesn't mean he was firstborn. He always was. We have already said. It means he is the most important person that ever lived. That's Jesus. Nobody like him. Nobody did what he did. Nobody could do what he did. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Folks, he's talking about Jesus. Everything, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. And folks, he willingly went to the cross. He did not have to go. He willingly went. He was not afraid of Pilate. I'm telling you, even on the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him. But the Bible said in the song says, but he died alone for you and for me. All things were created through him and for him. Are you getting the picture of what we're talking about Folks, He is everything, everything, everything to us. Verse 17, And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. Everything. All right, He created it. He sustains it. He knows everything about you. The Bible says He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your birth date. He knows your death date. He knows the day you're going to die. He knows how you're going to die. He's God in human flesh. And he is the head of the body of the church. This is not my church. It's not. It's Jesus's church. It's God's church who is the beginning and the firstborn of the dead. And here's the deal, folks. People died and was resurrected. Lazarus died and jesus resurrected him but you know what happened he died again jesus died in the third day he arose and he lives forever in heaven he is the way to heaven folks i hope you understand in this first point you know the incredible power of jesus the, the incarnation, this, this Jesus coming in the flesh, it wasn't a regular birth. There was many unusual things about it. And look at this. Who is the beginning of the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. You know what preeminence is? Number one. Oh, in sports, what do we, we love to win. We love to put our finger up and even, I, I don't get this, losing teams win one game. We're number one. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're terrible. Folks, Jesus wouldn't, I think, do it. But he is number one. He is preeminent. He is everything. He is supreme power. He is the absolute most important person in all of history that's our jesus matter of fact christianity is christ christianity is christ and christ is god so we see the incarnation of christ not only do we see the incarnation of christ i want you to see the ingenious birth of christ i'm telling you god is a genius he makes man look foolish. Foolish. You cannot go against God. You cannot win against God. He would smoke those ones on jeopardy, okay? Smoke them. The ingenious birth of Christ. Luke 1. Look at Luke 1, verse 26. Luke 1, 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin. Folks, remember that to a virgin had never been with a man, had never slept with a man, betrothed to a man who was Joseph of the house of David. And I just want to say, I'm telling you, 
I don't think they give Joseph enough credit in in all this. Because I'm telling you, he stuck with Mary. And there had at first had to be doubt in his mind saying, what in the world is going on? How is she pregnant? I mean, in our minds, it's just, you know, it takes a man and a woman. It, It just, biologically, there's no other way. But God is a genius. God is smart. God knew what he was doing. And we're going to show you why in just a second. Whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And we know that. And having come in, the angel said to her. And you have to realize, folks, we're talking probably 14, 15, or 16 years old. They, they married in those days. So an angel walks in your room. Okay, an angel walks in and says to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Man, that, I mean, she had to be blown away. Rejoice, you are highly favored. You were handpicked. God's hand is on your life. God is with you. The Lord is with you. You are blessed among women. He could have chose anyone, but he chose Mary. But when she saw him, she would trouble at his saying. Troubled means, I'm afraid. What is going on? Am I dreaming? What is going on here? And considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said unto her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. There's that word again. The favor of God. Listen to me, folks. We as Christians have the favor of God in our lives. And you know, sometimes we don't feel that way. But I promise you, if you will list everything that God has done for you, everything that He is presently doing with you, and everything that He's going to do with you, it will far outweigh whatever's going on in your life right now. You also are favored. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, capital S, and shall call his name Jesus. Mary didn't even get to name her own child. That was God's job. God says, I got a name. What does Jesus mean? Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is is salvation. He will be great. He will call, be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And I'm telling you, any Jewish girl would have understood what that meant. What that meant. King David was reverend and rever- you know, revered there deeply. And it's, he is simply saying, this baby Jesus is going to be a king one day. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Notice the wording, folks. Every word in the Bible means something. All kings that have ruled on the earth, you have the starting date and you have the ending date of that reign. He's saying, your baby Jesus is going to reign forever. It never ends. In his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Logic kicked in in her head. I do not know a man. I mean, she was blown away. Blown away. And then she was kind of gathering herself and thinking, now wait a minute. I know what I've done. It's never happened. I'm a virgin. 35, and the angel said unto her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. See, everybody thought maybe she slept with somebody else because if Joseph had to testify, he would have said, man, we haven't slept together. But do you realize the whole reason all this happened was because if Joseph was the biological father, Jesus would have sinned and had a sin nature just like you and I. He could not have been the perfect Son of God. Matter of fact, Proverb, I mean, uh, Psalm. Go to Psalm real quick. I just want to see one verse. I want you to see this. Psalm 51. 
Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Okay? Every one of us were born sinners. Hey, I can prove it to you. Tell a toddler, tell a two-year-old not to do something. Don't touch my stereo. Don't touch this light. Don't touch those presents. Sin nature. Every, everyone born of a man and a woman has a sin nature. In sin, my mother conceived me. Every one of us had a sin nature. And Jesus could not have been the perfect Son of God. So God told Mary, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to place the Holy Spirit inside of you. And I've heard people say this, not very often. They say, I don't believe that. My thing is, you don't believe the Word of God. And you don't understand who Jesus is. He is the perfect Son of God. Verse 35, and the angel said the Holy Spirit. Then verse 36, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. She could not have children, but she was about to give birth to John the Baptist. And they were cousins. Okay? And I love this verse. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Folks, all the time, all the time I hear people say something like this. Well, it just can't happen. It just can't happen. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and it's not happening. Folks, you need to quote the Word of God. With God, all things are possible. It is never over till God says it's over. There's always hope. The hope of salvation. The hope of Jesus Christ. The hope of God coming through. Verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. What did Mary say? Here I am, Lord. I don't understand all this. But you know what she was really saying? I surrender all. I surrender to your will. I surrender to your plan for my life. I don't understand it. They were poor. They didn't have money. They didn't have things. But God's hand was upon Mary. And let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The perfect son of God. Just one verse. 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5. For he, he, God, made him Jesus who knew no sin. Folks, that's the Bible. That's God breathed. That's God inspired. God is saying he never sinned. That's the only way he could be the unblemished Lamb of God, the perfect Son of God. He who made him, uh, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, listen to me, folks. Jesus' death paid for our salvation. And he couldn't die unless he was born and folks, Christmas is about Jesus' birth. The focus of Christmas is Jesus' birth. So we see the incarnation of Christ. We see the ingenious birth of Christ. But I want you to also see the infallible purpose of Christ. The infallible purpose of Christ. Why did He come? Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, folks, we need the mind of Jesus in our lives. We need to think like Jesus. We need to act like Jesus. We need to talk like Jesus. We need to be humble like Jesus. We need to have hope like Jesus. We need to minister like Jesus. We need to witness 
like Jesus. All of these things. His purpose, and I said it before, folks, his purpose was to die on the cross for our sins. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And I'm telling you, the scribes and the Pharisees, when he quoted things like, me and God are one, they went crazy. They went nuts. You are not the Son of God. You are not the promised Messiah. And folks, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the only hope for mankind. Thought it did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of of a bondservant. A bondservant is a nice way of saying slave. Slave. And coming in the likeness of man. In the likeness of man. Folks, Jesus got tired. Jesus got hungry. When you pinch Jesus, he felt it. When he was taking that beating, every lash, every whip that was on his back, he felt it. He was 100% God, 100% man. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death on the cross. Oh, folks, Jesus knew his purpose in life. Jesus knew why he was coming. Jesus, I am telling you, from the time he walked, was walking towards Jerusalem, and he was walking towards Golgotha. His whole life was to die. His whole purpose was to die for you and I. That's why when they take the Christ out of Christmas, it just it bothers me so much folks we got presents under our tree i put lights up outside i've got a manger scene now in my front yard i i man i'm gonna eat the candy that you bring me candy i'm gonna eat it but that is not the purpose of christmas jesus is christmas jesus is the reason for the season. And I believe with all my heart, now, this time, this time, in all of this pandemic, and all of this chaos, and all of this division is a time that people will pause for just a few weeks and think about Christmas. And when they do, folks, that just flings open a door for us to talk about Christmas our Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. He is the light of the world. He is the life of the world. Jesus Christ. He humbled himself, became obedient, even to the point of death. He knew he had to die. Listen to me, folks. We're all going to die. If God tarries, we're all going to die. But do you know what? To a Christian, death is just graduation day. This body will die. 2 Corinthians 5 speaks of it. It's just a tent. It's just a temporary dwelling place. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can live forever. Turn with me. Last scripture, Romans 5. Romans 5. Verse 6, Romans 5, verse 6, the infallible purpose of God. For when we were still without strength, Romans 5, 6, and in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? Everyone. Have you figured out John three sixteen yet? The most quoted scripture in the Bible, and still people hadn't figured that out. For God so loved the world that he gave 
His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that's everybody, He died on that cross for you. He died on that cross for me. He died on that cross for everyone that will ever be born here on earth. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. And in our minds and in logic, we'll say, well, if he's really, really good, I, you know, I would die for somebody like Billy Graham, and I would die for somebody like, and you fill in the blank. Most people, I'm telling you, when it got down to it, they wouldn't do it. They want to live. But he died. Yet perhaps a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know what Jesus was saying on the cross? Do you know what God was saying on the cross to you? I love you. I love you. I'll allow my son to die so that you can have life, that you can have peace, that you can have hope, that you can have Christmas. But God uh, demonstrated His love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Folks, we ought to be happy this Christmas time. And the reason we're not is we tie everything to money, folks. We wish we could get more gifts. We wish we could get nicer gifts. We wish we could... And do you just fill in the blank... But do you realize you have the greatest gift ever given to mankind? You have eternal life. You have eternal life. You will live forever and ever and ever with the perfect Son of God. With the God of this universe. With the most awesome worship. The Holy Spirit's going to be there, folks. It's going to be there. And we have all this too. We are saved by His life. Folks, I pray today that sometime today you will just take the time to thank Jesus. Not how many presents you have to wrap. Not what you haven't got done. Not how busy things are. Not that we're in a pandemic. Will you take the time just to think the Christ, Jesus, for Christmas. Father, I thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that your word is plain. Golly, it's plain. It's, it's so plain. Lord, we walk down through Scripture. You showed us the incarnation of Christ. You showed us the virgin birth. It happened. It happened that way. There was no other way for Jesus to be who he is. And He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Son of God. God, I pray that we would humble ourselves. I pray that we would have the joy of Christmas in our hearts and in our lives. God, if there's one person here that doesn't know You, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, the greatest gift they could get, the greatest gift is salvation. And I pray that they would just humble themselves. They would walk this aisle and say, simply, I need Jesus. I need the Christ of Christmas. Lord, maybe even Christians need to come to this prayer altar and rededicate their lives to Christ or follow the Lord in baptism or even come for church membership. God, that's your, this is your invitation. This is your church. This is your business. So God, I pray that when we walk out of here today, we will have a different attitude about Christmas. The Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's 
what we're celebrating. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you anyway, anyway, would you come?